Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's FP Virtual Dialogue, a very timely conversation about the role of think tanks in strengthening democracy during times of crisis and their potential to act locally to promote good governance and civil liberties. My name is Amy McKinnon. I am one of, I am one of Foreign Policy's National Security Reporters, and it is my pleasure to be your host this morning. There is no doubt in anybody's minds that we are living through turbulent times. Around the world, concerns about democratic backsliding, political polarization, and rising authoritarianism have been exacerbated by the impacts of COVID-19. The pandemic has further widened social inequalities and amplified threats to economic and civil liberties. In the face of these worrisome trends, can think tanks be a source of stability? Can they help to restore trust in institutions? What can think tanks do to foster policy reform and social cohesion? We will delve into those questions and more in just a bit. Today's programme also serves as a launch for, launch pad for our new study conducted by FP Analytics. That's Foreign Policy's Research and Advisory Wing. And we're going to hear from the author of those reports in just a second, which helps to under, better understand the degree to which local think tanks that are focused on democracy promotion and free markets have been able to affect policy agendas and make measurable impacts on the communities in which they operate. That report is available online and you'll hear about it a little bit more in just a second. We'll also short share information about how you can access it after the event. So thank you all for tuning in and of course a huge thank you to the Atlas Network for their partnership on this program. Before we begin, as always, as I'm sure you're used to by now, a couple of points of housekeeping. We want to make sure that we can hear from you, our global audience who are watching around the world. We have many hundreds of people joining in on Zoom today, as well as watching our live streams on social media. We've reserved a portion of the event today for questions from you, our global audience, and here is how you can get in touch. If you're on Zoom, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and submit your questions there. Please be sure to tell us your name, your organization, and where in the world you're joining from. If you're joining us over the phone or watching the live streams, you can email us your questions. The address is events at foreignpolicy.com. And as always, we encourage you to chime in on social media. So be sure to use our hashtag think tanks for democracy. And that's a number four, think tanks for democracy. So without further ado, let's get started. I am delighted to introduce our first two speakers to provide a high level perspective on the role of think tanks and their potential in helping communities navigate through times of transition and crisis and how think tanks should adapt to today's shifting geopolitical landscape. Welcome to the virtual stage, Simeon Jankov, who is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He was previously the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Bulgaria, and was previously a Chief Economist of the Finance and Private Sector of the World Bank. Brian Joseph is the Vice President for Programs at the National Endowment for Democracy. He has over 20 years of experience working to advance democracy and human rights. Prior to assuming his current role, Brian served as the Senior Director for Asia and Global Programs at the NED. Welcome to our program, Simeon and Brian. Hi, Amy. So, Simeon, I want to start with you. You, When you joined the government in Bulgaria in 2009, you, you joined a moment of, of, of high turbulence and crisis, not just for Bulgaria, but also for the world. What role in moments like that can think tanks play in supporting governments and, and societies to navigate the, these critical junctures? Um, Amy, I think that think tanks have two roles. One is a cyclical role and one is a counter-cyclical role, if you like. Mm -hmm. The cyclical role is that uh, in democracies, in old democracies like the US, but especially in young democracies like Bulgaria, New governments, like our government, need uh, both comprehensive programs, if you are as lucky as our party was to win, uh, and then run a government. And then you also need the people in this government, the experts in a government. And in both cases, uh, the first place to look actually outside the party is think tanks, because they have ready experts, they have thought of many of the issues um, over a long period of time. 
so in the case of our government, we actually had three or four ministers and a number of, um, uh, of other senior positions who came from within the ranks of uh, think tanks. And that was very useful mm -hmm. because these were people not affiliated with the party or, or any party for that matter, but they had uh, deep uh, expertise. So that's what I call the cyclical one. The counter cyclical one is that often uh, not just uh, uh, in countries like Bulgaria, which are young democracies, but uh, as you mentioned, the Eurozone crisis, now we have lived through a very significant uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, politics turn fairly populistic. In other words, uh, bigger role for governments, uh, uh, citizens are demanding more and more services uh, uh, from the government and governments often don't know how to do it and don't have the money to do it. Uh, so then it's the role of think tanks uh, uh, to support not just the government, but the political system, if you like, democracy, by reminding everybody, well, these are good requests, but they cost so much money, they will take so much time to be uh, done, to basically, uh, if you like, smooth over time the interest of, um, of citizens so that a country doesn't go from one crisis to another, from an economic crisis to a fiscal crisis, uh, and so on. So in short, both in my own experience as a politician in a small European country, but also from the experience that I've had uh, in international institutions like the World Bank, uh, think tanks are, if you like, both knowledge banks, but mm -hmm. also a source of stability. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, the, the kind of the, their role in the, the cyclical and the, and the counter cyclical, as you, as, as you, as you mentioned. Um, and when we spoke before our call today, when we were kind of touching base about, about this conversation, you mentioned uh, the Belarus has been a very interesting example right now of the role that think tanks can play. Um, the Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tikhonovska was in Washington last week. Um, and it's been incredible that over the course of a year, she's gone from being, you know, by her own you know, description, very apolitical. She was not involved in politics or opposition politi politics. And then this past week in Washington, her team are having meetings at the highest level with Secretary of State Antony Blinken, with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and people across Washington. And that's been an interesting transformation to watch how they've become this very potent political force. And behind the scenes, think tanks have actually played quite an important role. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about about the role they, they can play in these, in these moments of, of rupture as this was for Belarus. Indeed, uh, last week I was in Washington as well and met the uh, team, uh, the Belarusian mm -hmm. team, um, very, young, uh, very young people. Um, if you look uh, in more detail at their program, my interest of course is economics and finance, um, but uh, you see behind it the work uh, of uh, two fairly small by American standards, um, think tanks who have worked, uh, Belarusian think tanks who have worked on these topics over time. Uh, and they have served now both as a pool of experts uh, from this, for this young opposition, but also um, with the knowledge they have, not just of what policies can work in uh, Belarus, but also where else these policies have had success. In Spain, for example, we'll have a speaker from Spain uh, sometime uh, very soon. Uh, and this is incredibly uh, useful for a young um, political uh, uh, leader uh, because otherwise politics is good, but you ultimately need to show your program to people and who is going to do this program. And that's where the think tanks come. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in, in Brian now. Um, Brian, your background you know, was, was previously in, in, in Asia. How are think tanks there that are working under increased government scrutiny and increased regulations, how are they able to operate in these environments and how are they staying connected to their, to their international colleagues? And, and finally, to bundle in three questions all at once to you, what can you know, international organizations such as the NED do to support them at this moment? Thanks, Amy. Um, let, let me ask a few, few quick comments on that. Um, first, it, there's a huge diversity of authoritarian governments and closing societies across Asia. And my experience has been, it's really important to, to really drill down and understand what the context each of these think tanks are working on. Uh, there are a lot of examples and from China, you know, China has a wealth of think tanks um, that in certain periods of time have been more 
more independent, more autonomous, able to engage in certain sectors of work. Whereas at other points in time, the situation is much more repressive and the ability for any type of independent organization to, to operate is limited. Um, but that's the extreme. I think across the region, whether it's the Philippines, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, no matter what the level of political engagement, political repression at the moment, they've all developed um, centers of independent political thought. And I, I say that because I think the term think tank we often have a, a, concept, a concept of what a think tank looks like, but the reality is on the ground, think tanks do a lot of different things in these places. They, they do training, they do capacity building, they do policy analysis, they look at, uh, they do political um, program development, a range of things, but by situating themselves in their particular context, the creative dynamic ones find ways to continue to engage in their societies. And so, other than the most extreme environments, my experience has been that you do have think tanks who not only uh, continue to work in these authoritarian environments, but carve out a niche that allows them to pursue their agenda in the context of their societies. Um, and some of it can be the more sort of politically neutral work. Some of it is on development policy. Some of it might be on economic policy. Some of it might be on education policy. But even from a democracy point of view, in certain environments, all of that work is inherently political. And then they have a role of sort of liberalizing and pushing for an agenda that begins to create independent political space for citizens to engage their government, for citizens to engage different sectors. The other piece I would say about it is that I think a lot of people have a concept that think tanks primary goal should or is to influence government policy. But there's also a wealth of opportunity for them to engage and influence other important sectors, whether it's influencing trade unions or influencing business associations or, or the academy or educational institutions. There's a lot of other areas of influence that think tank can, in, can directly impact that will have a policy agenda. Um, so that's it. On the staying connected, I, I think that is absolutely critical. Um, there's no getting away from the specific context in which organizations operate. Uh, but there's also no getting away from the fact that almost no problem is unique to that society alone. So whether it's economic transition, political transition, development of an independent judiciary, development policy, trade policy, there are things that these think tanks need to learn from their peers, not just their near abroad, but around the world. And I think these efforts to really engage people engaged in similar types of work um, is critical to th the development of ideas. Um, and I think we, we, sh we shouldn't get away from the need for local specific knowledge from an analysis of the impact these organizations have in their host country, in their own countries, but also recognize they all benefit as do we all from that more global discussion of their principal problems. Uh, let me just wrap up by saying as far as how groups to support them, I, I, I come out of a sort of a frame of thought that ideas matter. Um, ideas matter greatly. And whatever term you like to think about think tanks, academics, newspapers, calmness, ideas matter. Ideas are what drive policy, ideas are what drive liberal values, and ideas are what drive authoritarian values. And we cannot be shy about being engaged in the competition of ideas with the hope that the best, uh, most tolerant liberal ones will prevail, but recognizing that politics, policy, governance that's not anchored in ideas is, um, it's hard to imagine how that leads to a better outcome. So I think for us, uh, irrespective of the, the, the level of authoritarianism or democratic development or, the, or where the country is in the political spectrum, you cannot, ref you have to engage in a discussion of ideas. And I think think tanks play a really important role in that regard. Mm -hmm. Brian, you're you know, quite uniquely placed at NED to have a, a very global overview of how various kind of currents and, and, and shifts in politics and societies are, are changing the environments for think tanks. I mean, what are you seeing, you know, how, it, how are things like, you know, ideological polarization, e economic inequality, you know, the pandemic and, and everything that that has brought with it. How, are, how is that affecting, affecting the work of, of think tanks and, and these other, you know, ideas, ideas-based organizations that you mentioned? Um, I, I will give you, a, 
sadly, it's, I think, a simple answer, um, perhaps, perhaps too simple. But I think the, the biggest change I've seen, which is global, and I don't think this will surprise anyone, is that there's no longer sort of a, a filter for ideas. Um, that social media, the internet, has allowed for, in some sense, the democratization of ideas. There are fewer and fewer uh, entities, editors, institutions that control and propagate ideas, um, which in a sense is a liberalizing, liberalized, liberalizing and demo democratizing trend. At the same time, I think it's led to a, a blurring of the lines um, and a, a muddying of the waters of ideas and rigorously studied, rigorously debated, rigorously challenged ideas. And I, and I think getting to a place where there is trust in the institutions again, there's trust in those who are pushing ideas, there's trust in the, the research and the rigor that underpins those ideas is something we have to move back towards. I, I have no idea how we get there, um, but I think one of the global changes as you see everywhere is that everybody around the world can put their ideas out there. It's increasingly difficult to distill and understand unless you're intimately involved in the specifics of a country, who is legitimate, how are they doing their research, why do they have credibility, how connected are they to their societies. And then that, that global trend, it's not unique to just think tanks, but I think the think tank world has a real challenge in that regard of trying to establish credibility, uh, rigor, sophistication to the ideas so that people know, know what they're reading, they know where the ideas are coming from and they know what's behind these ideas that everyone is, um, is using to ill and good effect. That's a really excellent point. And if I can just make a plug for our audience, one of our uh, regular authors, Paul Musgrave, had a, had a really fascinating piece on that for us recently. The title is currently escaping me, but if you look up his byline on foreign policy, he had a great piece about um, uh, the, the, the danger of, of un, unfiltered and un, 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 unroad tested uh, uh, ideas that being released into the world. Um, I now want to turn to, uh, we've had some audience questions come in. Um, we have one from, from Carlos at Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who says, you know, Carlos notes that there's obviously been a lot of, of talk about the creating a summit of democracies, which is one of the, the goals of, of the Biden administration to, to create and shape global efforts around the world. Um, and Carlos asks if, if the panel could comment on, on how such a process makes sense and what role could think tanks play in this effort. I will I'll let you two fight out who wants to jump in first on that. Maybe I start. Um, sure. so, so in some sense, unlike the previous administration, this administration has already made uh, uh, first steps, uh, first within the context of G7, uh, the G7, um, uh, countries are all democracies, uh, so you could say that uh, there is already a, a good basis for that uh, in the previous four years. Uh, to remind our listeners, there was very little that G7 could do, uh, could do together. Now they already have had uh, two fairly successful um, uh, meetings. The third one is coming in October. The global tax proposal uh, is one, um, one such uh, uh, result that has been in the making for nearly 20 years and successfully we have such a base. And of course you need to expand beyond the rich, uh, the rich economies, uh, Amy. So that's where Carlos's question of involving um, India, involving Brazil, and, uh, uh, and a number of economies in, uh, in Africa and Asia as well, will be uh, welcome. One needs to be careful, I think, not to undermine the United Nations, some of the other international institutions who have actually suffered over the last few years, because of, uh, often because of the attitude of the US administration. And now, as uh, Brian mentioned, because of COVID. So we need to think of how to, uh, first both the existing institutions, which are the base for some of our main discussions, uh, democratic discussions, and then build uh, upon that. Thank you. Ryan, did you want to offer any thoughts on that? No, I, I don't really have much to add on that one, um, except to say that I, I do think you're sort of the question of the role of think tanks. There have been precursor efforts along these lines. And I do think this is the type of thing for, for people who have the time, space, and resources to really try to analyze what worked well, what sort of drove the community of democracies forward, for example, or in, in sort of impeded its sort of its vision from being fully realized. And I think 
as, as the Biden administration and others begin to push this agenda, really having a concrete understanding of what preceded it and what work would be important. But I don't, on the specifics of it, I just think it's, um, I don't have much to add to that, sorry. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I want to now quickly pivot to the role that think tanks can play in, in building bridges between civil society and government. And I'm wondering, maybe Brian, this is a question for you, you know, what role do they play in that? And, and how can think tanks kind of better bolster their role in making this connection? Um, it's a good question. And let me answer it sort of this way. One is, is I don't think all think tanks should aspire to being bridge builders. I think some think tanks really should aspire to be putting out ideas and proposals and policies that force others to react to them. Um, at the same time, clearly in a whole range of places that, civil, that think tanks are in a position to push policies and agendas that help build bridges, particularly in deeply divided societies. You mentioned early about the ideological divides you see across growing ranges of countries. Um, and think tanks are there, uh, can begin to do that. And it goes back to something I said in the beginning. My, my experience has been it's often the more limited and narrow the engagement, the better the initiative, the better the out likelihood of an outcome. So if you're trying to tackle uh, a problem in a deeply divided society, it's often really difficult to get at the macro level issue. But if you begin to sort of chip away at it by taking issues that these various communities who are on different divides, whether it's ethnic, religious, economic, and begin to look at certain engagements that will bring the communities together, will begin to soften those divides. I think that's a huge opportunity for think tanks to do it. The other thing is I, I do think, um, even though I believe that think tanks should not all aspire to sort of to occupy the center, for the think tanks that occupy the center, it's really important that they don't leave constituents behind and don't leave the consideration of how their policies and the programs they're promoting will be understood and received in the various communities. Because the, the second you disengage the ideas that think tanks put forward from the communities that, there's, that they hope to benefit, they then just become papers that are written without an audience. And I think that bridge building exercise, when it can really be anchored in the needs of a community, when it can be narrowly enough tailored and identified that it can have deliverable output, they really can serve that function of, of building divides. But, excuse me, at the same time, I do think that we, should, we shouldn't shy away from the idea that these think tanks are engaged in a competition of ideas and that to bring them together to compete and debate their ideas can have that same effect and convince people that you can be on the opposite sides of an issue but have the same long-term objective or broad, broad objective that's worth pursuing despite policy or analytical differences. Fascinating. Simeon, we have, um, we just have a couple of minutes, but I wanted to bring you in on that point. I mean, what role do you see think tanks playing in moments of transition in society where everything is in flux, you know, governments are changing, um, you know, there's, there's political polarization going on. What, what kind of role do the think tanks play in that, in that field? I very much agree with Brian that there are uh, situations, particularly in uh, uh, highly um, divisive or divided societies where you need think tanks to step in. Belarus is a case in question, as I mentioned, and try to bring the uh, divide uh, at least a bit closer. Um, but also as Brian mentioned, uh, even in these divided societies, sometimes fairly narrowly specialized uh, uh, think tanks uh, that, uh, that uh, look at specific sectors or policies play, play a great and very important role. I'll finish, Amy, just uh, my own country, Bulgaria, is in the midst of uh, rounds of elections. So this week, we're supposed to have a new government where two entirely new parties have never been in politics before that are trying to form the government. And my favorite current uh, Bulgarian think tank, actually supported by the Atlas Foundation historically, is a fiscal think tank that anytime that the new politicians suggest a policy, they say, how are you going to finance it and who is it going to reach? And it's very interesting to see how these politicians who have just won the majority of votes cannot answer these two questions, simple questions. So that to me is huge value to society. 
Thank you, Amy. Fascinating. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much to you both for, for joining us today and sharing our thoughts. We have a packed schedule today, so, so we now have to move on. But thank you again, Simeon and Brian, for joining us today for this discussion. Thank you. We're now gonna take a look at our new FP Analytics latest report titled Navigating Through Turbulence, Think Tank's Impact on a Rapidly Changing World. And here to help us highlight some key findings from the report, we have Is Isabel Schmidt, who is policy analyst here with Farm Policy, and we have Faud per Pervez, who's senior policy, policy, senior policy analyst with FP Analytics. So diving in with you first, Issy, um, could you maybe tell us about the report what were you hoping to discover when you began this research and, and why was it important to the research team? Absolutely. Um, when we started this research, we really wanted to understand more about the role of local think tanks amid, as you said before, a number of negative global trends. So the world is in the midst of a decline in democracy and good governance, um, some economic stagnation and an increase in poverty that has been exposed and exacerbated by the pandemic, but that was taking place before the pandemic even began. Uh, and think tanks are working on the front lines of these issues. They're identifying and monitoring the effects of these trends and also proposing and implementing solutions. So we were interested in understanding how think tanks as organizations are interacting with these negative global trends, how they're responding to them, and also how think tank staff are experiencing the knock-on effects and challenges that stem from these trends on a more local level. Mm, fascinating. Fawad, can you tell us more about these trends and what are we seeing globally? Yeah, as Izzy just noted, in recent years, we've seen a reversal in uh, political and economic development after decades of progress. There's been a long-term decline in democracy globally, and even the strongest of democracies have been affected by this. And there are clear research, uh, there are clear consequences of this decline, worse health outcomes, lower education attainment, lower economic growth. And some data that, that we found, you know, 35% of the global population live in states that are becoming more authoritarian, while just 8% live in states that are becoming more democratic. And then in 2019, GDP growth was at its lowest level um, in the past decade, and it's just before the pandemic. And obviously, as we know, the pandemic has ex exacerbated a lot of these trends. And then data from um, the survey and info from our interviewees also reflected this. When asked to evaluate the seriousness of particular issues in their countries, 71% of think tank staff identified governance as a serious concern, and 56% identified declining liberal democratic norms as a serious concern. These were the highest among the issues that we looked at. Wow. So Izzy, back to you. I mean, that's really, you know, there are quite some striking statistics. I mean, where is this report adding value to the research that's already out there? Where does this sit in the landscape about what we know? So as Simeon and Brian were talking about, think tanks have the potential to be incredibly influential actors uh, on the national stage in terms of policy influence. And they also do a lot of different things, which makes them a group that's quite hard to understand and analyze. So we feel that we're filling a gap in the existing literature by focusing on local think tanks and by asking staff for their views, both on these negative global trends and how they're manifesting and how they themselves are uniquely positioned to address them. And it was really important to us to hear from staff at a wide range of organizations around the world. We spoke to people based in 80 different countries uh, and people who are working under varying political and economic regimes and taking distinct approaches to addressing these issues. Uh, and the other thing that I'm really proud of with this report is that we wanted to provide a space for the staff of organizations that don't have access to an audience and a platform like we do here at FP and at FP Analytics small organizations uh, in countries where you might not expect them to have really a thriving civil society or think tank culture. And as autocracy and authoritarianism rises in a lot of these places, uh, think tanks ability both to make and to demonstrate impact will be important to their continued existence, making these conversations really timely. And so for these, these think tanks that you had conversations with, I mean, that's an incredible number, 80 countries, what did you hear from them? What impact do they, do they report having on their societies? Thanks, Amy. So um, first thing we should note is that everyone measures impact differently. 
Some end up focusing on policy changes, others on changes in public opinion. Essentially, there's no definitive way that we found that think tanks measure impact. And we also need to keep in mind some interviewees uh, that we talked to suggested that there were real risks to think tanks directly trying to change policy. So for instance, there was a think tank in Bolivia that purposely avoided any kind of policy work uh, to basically stay under the radar of the government out of fear of what might happen. Um, think tanks are also changing what they do based on these different local challenges. So we found that 40% of our interviewees noted that their think tanks work primarily on non-research activities, which we would think of as sort of the bread and butter of traditional think tanks. And we're talking about um, business and other skills training, translating economic te text into local languages, diversifying school curriculum and youth capacity building. And despite all these challenges, most uh, reported that their think tanks made a positive impact overall and a positive impact in each of the four major issues that we looked at. And um, we're talking about like a very large majority of respondents that reported making either a somewhat or a substantial impact on each of the different issues. And most were around 80% of respondents. And when we talk about impact, an example would be, there's a think tank in the Philippines. It's focused on improving property rights and it's success with a campaign to pass laws uh, that improve domestic and agricultural property rights. And this affects 2.5 million farmers and over 50,000 homeowners. We also did a little bit of statistical modeling that gave us a little bit more insight in terms of impact. One of the main findings we had um, was that staff from think tanks that are operating in what we think of as fragile states actually reported that they were making a larger impact than those in stable states. And um, based on the survey data, think tanks in fragile states were 14 percentage points more likely to report making a substantial impact on impacting liberal democratic norms uh, compared to think tanks that are in stable states. And what we're talking about, like a fragile state, South Sudan, you know, we interviewed a, a think tank leader there and they focus on making it easier to do business for businesses and the kinds of things that they have to do are a lot more extensive. So they're, they're helping young entrepreneurs navigate all the different complexities of setting up and operating businesses in the country. Also, they also have to highlight the laws that they think need to be changed to encourage private enterprise. So there's just a lot more that has to be done in these places. Wow, that's incredible. Um, you mentioned there that you know a lot of what you studied was, was local think tanks. And Issy, I'm wondering if you can just expand on, on why you, you made the point to emphasize local think tanks and what do, you, what do you mean by a local think tank and what are some of the most important aspects of their work? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, when we talk about local think tanks in the context of this report, we're talking about those operating on the national or subnational level. So obviously that global expertise is really important, but these are organizations with highly contextual knowledge that they can apply. So the majority of the staff that we surveyed identified highly localized factors contributing to the challenges that they and their countries are facing. And local organizations are often among the best positioned to respond to those challenges. Local think tanks are able to identify suitable partners for their work. They can adjust their activities according to local needs and challenges. And they can also frame issues in terminology that's relevant to local populations. So one uh, think tank that we profiled in the report uh, uses Islamic scholarship and works with Muslim scholars in Afghanistan in order to educate the public on issues such as civil liberties in terminology and using issues that they really interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and are really comfortable with. Uh, and doing so, they've successfully worked both with the general population and then with policymakers, including in advising in the writing of the new Afghan constitution in the last few years. Wow, well, that's quite some impact. Um, so Fouad, looking ahead, I mean, what can think tanks and their supporters take away from, from your analysis that we're launching today? Um, so we think there are a couple key lessons to take from this report. There's a lot of data and lessons, and I would direct our listeners to check out the report for a lot more of the details, but just a few examples. Um, for think tanks, um, one thing that we think is that they should consider diversifying their funding sources. The pandemic has highlighted just, you know, what happens when emergencies occur and how funds are diverted um, from philanthropies and in international institutions that think tanks often rely on. Um, so a lot of our interviewees, for instance, noted the importance of um, finding different funding sources. And then for donors and stakeholders um, uh, with respect to think tank impact, there are also a couple of useful lessons. And one 
Um, donors should work to strengthen impact assessments. There's a real need uh, for help by these uh, for, for by these local think tanks to get better at this. But besides just the simple um, illustrating of just how effective they've been, these assessments can help think tanks in securing additional funding from other sources as they, you know, funders and uh, stakeholders will see just, you know, their uh, capacity and their impact in terms of what they're doing. Wow, that's uh, that's incredible. So. Moving on, we have a, a packed schedule, but thank you so much, both of you, for, for joining us. And, and just a reminder for our audience that um, you know, our, the, the, the report is available online now at navigatingthroughturbulence.com. That's navigatingthroughturbulence.com. We'll also share this info in an, in, with, with our audience in a follow-up email. And thank you again to Isabel, Isabel Schmidt and Faud Perez for joining us today. So to move on to the next segment of our program, we have a distinguished panel joining us to continue the conversation. I would like to welcome Roxana Nikula, the president of the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty, Arpita Nepal, the co-founder and advisor of, the research, of research and development with the Sam Ritty Foundation, and Sarah Lucas, program officer for the Gender and Equity and Governance Program at William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Welcome all to our virtual stage. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. So I'm going to begin with Sarah, picking up from a point that, um, that we heard uh, from the new FP analytics report about funding, about the, the, the problem, the challenge that some think tanks have had during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, you know, how can funders support think tanks to ensure that they're more flexible and able to respond to crises? Because I, I worked in fundraising before going to journalism and you know, programmatic funding is one thing, but getting that kind of core support, um, both for the boring stuff like keeping the lights on, but also to ensure that you're flexible and, and to be nimble to respond to things is not quite so easy. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy. I would say that at the Hewlett Foundation, our experience aligns quite well with some of the recommendations from the report that Isabel and Fuad have just articulated. So one of them is really focusing on local think tanks for all of the reasons that Isabel laid out. And that would be as opposed to, for example, looking to a US-based or European-based think tank to understand African policies and politics, right? So we would much prefer to support the think tanks that are embedded in and have deep relationships uh, in their own national context. So that's the first and it aligns strongly with the recommendations from the report. The second, um, which they didn't mention, but does come out in the report is the spirit of funding networks of think tanks. Because if we believe as Brian so strongly articulated in the value, the kind of inherent value of ideas driving democracies, then it's you need to support more than just individual think tanks here and there, but you really need to help strengthen the ecosystem that think tanks need to thrive. So some examples of that, um, from the Hewlett Foundation, we've supported for years a network of think tanks called Southern Voice, which is think tanks from Africa, South Asia, and Latin America working together on the Sustainable Development Goals. And what we've found with, this, with Southern Voice is that the global profile that the network has ends up increasing the credibility and influence at national level for each of the partner think tanks. And so the network not only helps elevate their global voices or their Southern voices on a global stage, but that elevation gives them more credibility at home. And another example I would give of something we've supported to help strengthen the sector is called On Think Tanks, which is a community of think tank thinkers and writers and scholars who share information and lessons on everything from the nuts and bolts of think tank management all the way up to what are think tanks doing in terms of elections and democracy and promoting women in leadership in countries. So on think tanks is a really important community of practice for think tankers to come together and learn from each other. So we believe that that is helping support this general idea that Brian has advocated um, of ideas really mattering for, for democracies. Another thing that came up in the report that we find to be 
really important is strengthening organizational capacity among think tanks. And, you know, one of the really big lessons that I learned through our experience with the Think Tank Initiative, which was a 10 year multi fender initiative to support think tanks in the global south is that you want to put each organization in charge of identifying their own capacity needs and look to their peers to fill those capacity needs. It is very tempting for funders to say, oh, this group of think tanks really needs help with financial management or with fundraising or with whatever. But the fact of the matter is each organization's ability to identify their needs and to help meet those needs through their peers is going to have much longer lasting impacts on organizational capacity than some funders deciding what what they need um where where the report is silent and amy this gets right to your question is that how you fund think tanks is as important as who you fund and what you fund them to do so there's three things that i've learned at the hewlett foundation that i would recommend to all funders the easiest one is cover the full costs of what it takes for policy research to be influential. If what you care about is ideas influencing democracy, societies, and governments, you can't just fund research papers. The full costs of influence include your communications team, your outreach team, and having a strong institution behind any research that you're supporting. The second is to fund flexibly. And that allows local think tanks to do everything that Isabel said, to be responsive to their opportunities, to be nimble in the face of conflict or, or transitions. Um, and it allows them to have a predictable path for their research. It allows them to not only pursue things of immediate importance that donors might be thinking of, but to look way ahead of the curve of issues that might be important in the future. So funding flexibly really strengthens institutions' capacity to be nimble and influential in their communities. And so what that means for funders is that you don't have to think necessarily about I'm funding a research project, I'm aligning with a particular body of research, but you align with an institution and give them the freedom to act in their own context. This increases the institution's independence because it's less easy to claim that some funder is just, you know, advancing an agenda. This increases their responsiveness and nimbleness in the context of transition, and it helps position them to have an enduring set of relationships with governments because they can have the running room uh, financially to hire the right people, to convene, to do all the things that they need to do to have credibility in their societies. And I think that the COVID pandemic has really proved this point because none of us predicted it. None of us funded think tanks to be responsive in a pandemic, but those that have, at least in our portfolio, those that had the most impact on being nimbly responsive to government's massive needs for data and information during COVID were those that were funded flexibly. And I have to believe if this report and this whole premise of this conversation is about the importance of think tanks in fragile societies, none of us can predict what's going on in those societies from day to day and year to year. And so funding flexibly allows the institutions in those societies to be responsive and influential, even though we can't predict where things are going. So those would be my tips for how to fund uh, think tanks to be um, most impactful in elevating ideas and strengthening democracy. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive introduction, Sarah. I, I want to bring in uh, uh, Arpita now and staying on this conversation that we that we heard earlier uh, in the report about the question of impact and how do you how do you measure impact? I'd love to get your thoughts based on on your experience with the Sam Ritty Foundation about you know how do you measure impact? What does that look like? And and how can donors improve ways of measuring the impact and success of initiatives with things such like women's economic empowerment programs? If I can just add on to what Sarah just put in and my two cents on funding, I think one thing that uh, we really need to understand as think tanks working on whether fragile or semi-stable states or wherever in the developing world you are in, I think uh, the independence and credibility of a think tank is highly, uh, you know, it's established only on the basis if you are able to diversify your funding portfolio, which means adding in local donors and bringing in local uh, 
you know, people who believe in your ideas, in the work that you're doing is exceptionally important. So I think uh, sometimes as think tanks working in developing world, if you're just looking for institutional funding from the developed world, I think that is where a lot of weaknesses regarding foreign, you know, intervention of ideas and so on and so forth actually come in into the think tank world and it loses uh, credibility to a large extent. Uh, coming back to the question of impact and, you know, it, this is one of the impact is whether the ideas that you're pr uh, promoting is actually perceived as independent, as coming from where you come from. Is it locally relevant? How locally relevant have you made it? Uh, and so in that sense, I think uh, what one of the ways we actually measure our impact is how many local donors do we have? How many people have we con convinced locally to actually invest in us, to say that we're doing something that, you know, that is worth doing uh, in that sense. The other measure of impact, and I go back to what Brian initially uh, talked about in terms of spreading of ideas is for a country like Nepal, where we were one of the you know, initial uh, think tanks to actually come into prominence and uh, bring about the debate of think tanks in Nepal at itself. I think we took it um, upon ourselves as a responsibility to try and nurture other think tanks. And so you know, we established a local network because Nepal is going through a federalism process. We are federalizing. It's a new federalizing uh, system. We're learning a lot about constitutional processes. And we think that think tanks have an major role to play, especially when we're deciding policies at the local level. Sitting in Kathmandu at the national level, I still cannot decide what is the best policy for the Western province of Nepal. And so I'd rather see a think tank that's actively involved, you know, locally grown, uh, that actually puts forward these ideas. And I think we've been uh, pretty successful because we've been on it for about five or six years now. And so that is another measure of our impact is, you know, these goals we set for ourselves, uh, you know, have we actually been able to achieve those goals or not? The traditional impact measurement is, of course, how many people you've reached, uh, you know, how uh, did you, were you able to make any policy changes? Again, if you're in the business of changing ideas, of promoting different ideas, have you managed to actually materialize any of those uh, in terms of policy changes? And I think, you know, that's one aspect of think tank. And as a think tank, we absolutely measure uh, those as well. Uh, but, you know, sort of new ideas in terms of thinking of impact is, I would rather say, how many beneficiaries, uh, you know, of the ideas that we promoted have actually benefited from the ideas that we put forward. That's one measure of impact. And the second is how many locally, uh, you know, local people have we actually convinced that we, we should be around. We are a good, uh, you know, investment in general. So staying with you for a moment, Arpita, we have a question that is coming from the audience specifically from, from you, and it's from Basanta Adikari, my apologies if I have pronounced that wrong, who is from the uh, Bikalpa and Alternative in, in Nepal. Um, and they ask, how do we promote the values of freedom and democracy where populism is on the rise and rule of law is weak and liberal values are, in their view, not cherished in society? Absolutely. Uh, that is, uh, you know, a problem in general you face. Uh, you are working against the tide uh, if you are working on ideas of promoting, uh, you know, liberal values in general in a place like Nepal. However, I think uh, a couple of things. We need to be a chameleon. Uh, and that only, uh, you know, uh, what role you play and how you actually change that depends on your local circumstance, I would say. So say, for example, uh, in Nepal, when the Maoists were highly in power, one of our primary uh, roles as a think tank was not working on policy. Our primary role on a think tank was educating young people on uh, liberal values, ideas of liberal values. Uh, you know, uh, we worked a lot with young politicians. Uh, we tried to build their capacity in terms of saying what I, tomorrow once you go in power what kind of policy ideas are you going to talk about you know all these policy ideas that your uh, government or your campaign material is promoting is this viable is this fiscally viable you know we're asking these important questions and you're working with a younger politician probably is more open to learning new ideas because uh, that politician he or she has not held the post and isn't responsible but is thinking about how am I going to deliver tomorrow so you really uh, in, if you're working Working in a difficult environment, I strongly believe as a think tank that you really need to adapt to local circumstances. This comes in terms of whether education is your priority at certain moments of time, or if policy work is your priority at other moments of time. At other moments of time, uh, it might be, uh, for example, for a long time, we just work on the 
entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we worked with uh, venture capitalists, we worked with, uh, you know, uh, registration policies and things like that. So we worked on the entrepreneurial ecosystem for a very long period of time because other ideas were just not conducive to promote at that point of time. So it really depends on your local circumstance. Um, so you have to stay on your toes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to bring in uh, Roxana now. Um, I'm curious, I mean, how has, the, how has the pandemic impacted the work of the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty? And what have you learned about, about resilience and, and planning for future crises? Um, actually, uh, thank you, Amy. This is a, a very important question for us because uh, the pandemic, as you all know, hit us very hard all around the world, but uh, especially in Spain, we lost a lot of people uh, because we didn't have the right policies in place. We didn't have the system prepared to even sustain a little bit uh, the, the shaking of, of this pandemic. And uh, on top of that, when uh, it emerged uh, as a young organization, because we have uh, created uh, our foundation in 2015, we had to deal also with personal complications, with people working closely with us, losing their relatives. Uh, we also face some downfalls from a financial perspective, losing important donations locally. Uh, but uh, where there is a crisis, I always say there is also an opportunity. And this, for instance, in our case, it helped us realize that we needed to change some of the operative we had. We even moved to a more central location in a professional business center instead of maintaining a lot of office space unused. Anyhow, even before the crisis, because our people were already working very efficiently from home in different parts of the country and the world. Uh, our foundation is, is not only developing projects uh, in Spain, but also we are doing projects internationally. So uh, during this pandemic, we took uh, the opportunity and start our, for instance, intern program with three major universities in Spain. Uh, we also had uh, our first five local interns developing their internship uh, with Fundalib. I'm proud of all of them. They did a, a very, very good job. So I would say that COVID helped us better distribute our resources and even move the Overton window to affect the political discourse and uh, the policy agenda, for instance, in the case of the healthcare policy. We started a campaign uh, that uh, lasted for a year that was called uh, uh, Private Healthcare Saves Lives Campaign. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we managed to pull through and um, contribute with uh, sufficient ammunition and data for policy reforms that resulted in uh, lowering uh, VAT for some of the medical uh, equipment that we needed, like for instance, the, the masks to, to protect ourselves. Uh, we managed to, to work with the, the education ministry to flexibilize more the um, homologation of, of university titles for foreign professionals for the, uh, for the healthcare sector. And uh, this uh, was a, a very important uh, achievement that uh, we, we were very, very proud to have contributed to our society and to help them in, in these times of need. So, uh, I mean, um, until the pandemics, um, no one was willing, for instance, to listen to our arguments in favor of, of a more private health care and uh, our policy reforms proposals uh, to strengthen the sector, the private sector used by 11 million users before and now by 13 million users as a consequence of, of the pandemic um, was uh, a, great, uh, import, uh, of, of great importance to us. So this is um, an opportunity that we, we managed to, to thought, to work upon it and to, uh, and to thrive, fortunately, for, for our country. So moving away from the, from the ever present topic of the pandemic, it's still all we all seem to be able to talk about. Um, I wanted to ask you, Roxana, more, more generally, how important is, is it for you for working with, with think tanks and institutions with, with different, different ideological viewpoints and, and how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, although we are uh, kind of ideologically driven, we also uh, know that when working with different uh, type of uh, public administrations, different uh, policy makers, we, are, we kind of understand that they uh, may come from different ideological perspectives. Uh, they 
come from different political parties also. And we have to make sure that our language, our studies are uh, delivered to them in a way uh, to engage them and try to understand that our solutions, irrespective of the name, uh, they, whether they are called free market, are libertarian or classic liberals, are actually working even for their benefit as uh, public uh, leaders. So this is our, let's say, um, key to, to try and, and to reach to them. And fortunately, we have been uh, managing so far to, to have some, several break, breakthroughs. We are working currently with uh, uh, policymakers, with politicians from parties uh, from both, uh, you know, uh, a political spectrum or center right and, and center left in some of the cities because uh, they realized that what we are giving them, the tools we are, we are proposing uh, for them to help them in their um, daily uh, public administration work is actually giving more and better results for even for their own uh, you know, constituency image and uh, other than other kind of studies that are more um, ideologically uh, close to them, let's say. So uh, that uh, helped us a lot to reach to them and to deliver those tools. Uh, we are very specialized in comparative research. So we understand that any politician, uh, policy makers in general are, are, don't have enough time to uh, scan everything. So we try to work with them and give them very, very specific, narrow, and rigorous information and very simple tools for them to assimilate in a very short period of time for them and their uh, consultants, of course. And that, I believe, helped us and uh, made us to, to go up in, in the ladder of, uh, of branding our, our foundation as a foundation that uh, is working uh, very comfortably with many administrations in the, regarding, regardless of their ideological uh, orientation. Um, just uh, last month, the, for instance, the mayor of Alicante Center uh, right uh, ideology uh, was mentioning our work uh, because uh, one of our studies, uh, the index for electoral, for uh, economic freedom for Spanish cities ranked its, his city as first uh, again this year because they, they did a lot of the <laughs> things we, we recommended them to, to do over the, five, the uh, last three years. And in a national gathering of mayors of uh, many cities in Spain, he, he was saying, look, we, we have done our homework uh, according to the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty, Ilefe Alicante, yet this year again uh, ranks the first one. And uh, this is important because uh, this means that our residents are happy we offer a public administration that is not a burden, to, to companies and to residents there. I mean, we managed to get through them and to help them assimilate the, the importance of practical uh, free market solutions without necessarily uh, doing uh, you know, a screening of ideological soundness in every study we do. So this is our, our own experience in this uh, respect. Fascinating. So I want to now we have a few minutes for a couple of audience questions. Um, and I'm going to go to one we have from um, Baron Mitra, um, who doesn't say where they're from. Um, and I'm going to let you decide who wants to jump in on this one. Um, uh, 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 Baron says, experts have lost credibility around the world. The pandemic has underscored the contradictory perception of think tanks among wider population between the roles of experts and disdain for experts. They ask, have think tanks lost their credibility because they're seen to be catering to governments and political authorities and interest groups? And how can think tanks reach out to citizens, you know, which would be critical if these liberal democratic values are to be reinforced? I'm seeing Sarah nodding there. Do you want to do you have some thoughts you want to share on that? Well, the one thing I would say is to some degree, uh, there's some 
validity in the concern, right? The think tanks are operating at too elite an intellectual level and not as well connected with communities. So I'd love to actually hear from Arpita because she said one of her measures of success is the degree to which beneficiaries are benefiting from, from their policy recommendations or their work. But I would just point out, you know, we have supported at Hewlett many, many think tanks. And one stands out for me as bridging to communities really, really well. And that is a think tank in Senegal called EPAR. They focus on agricultural and environmental issues. And they're the only think tank that I know of that has on their governing body members of the communities that they hope to support. So they have farmers organizations serving on their governing body and have put a huge amount of effort into building relationships, collaborative research relationships and policy engagement relationships with farmers across Senegal and farmers associations with across Senegal. And so that gives them just a reality check on all of the work that they're doing to, you know, and, and a ready sounding board about how is this going to affect communities. But it also gave them a huge leg up in the COVID context when, you know, mobility lockdowns were hitting Senegal so hard at the beginning of COVID. And they were the first ones to begin raising the alarm about how this is not only going to be affecting rural agricultural communities, but the overall food supply chain in Senegal. And so they, together with their partner farmer organizations, were able to argue for limiting some restrictions because we were going to, they were going to lose huge amounts of staple food supplies because mobility was restricted. So that relationship with communities not only gives them a sense check on their policy recommendations, creates more credibility in their governance, but makes them much more able to be responsive and have kind of a finger on the pulse of what's happening in communities with big policy shifts. Arpisa, did you want to jump in on that one? Uh, I would just throw it back on to Varun's own experience. Varun's from India and he's run a very successful uh, program of mapping land with indigenous communities and bringing pro private property rights to the purview of these indigenous communities. Uh, I've known him for a long time and I think that's exactly how you become relevant to local communities is working with the grassroots, is trying to figure out exactly where you can fit in. For example, with the COVID pandemic, a lot of uh, think tank work in general at the local level has been on helping local government on contact tracing and actually you know figuring out and uh, figuring out isolation centers at the local level uh, donating a lot of their time uh, and you know helping communities cope with the crisis where uh, central government attention hasn't been enough uh, so you know these local responses I think uh, think tanks that are most effective are most connected to grassroots at the end of the day and Roxana I'd be interested in your thoughts on how this you know how this fits in the, in the European context? I mean, how can, how can think tanks remain connected to society and, and maintain their sense of relevance? Yeah, uh, Amy, actually it's a very, very important aspect of, of our work uh, at our think tank because uh, we work closely, not only with other think tanks, like-minded think tanks in, in Spain and internationally, but also with other kind of grassroots organizations in our country. Uh, we cooperate a lot with the uh, students' organizations so that we can have a, a better grasp of what is happening in the university at a, in, at a younger uh, level. We also work with entrepreneurial uh, associations and uh, this kind of bodies so that we can be connected in all time with all the important uh, happening in their territories so that we can then... Um, let's say, um, analyze and input all, all those needs, all, all those challenges in the work we do afterwards. Uh, because this uh, afterwards is, going, is giving us uh, strength when we go to policy makers, to opinion leaders, to mass media and tell them, hey, we have a very big problem with this issue. In Spain, for instance, we have a very, very high unemployment for the young people. And we detected that this high unemployment also means that many young people are not keen uh, into becoming entrepreneurs, but rather they would uh, present themselves as uh, public servants, take, uh, take the exam, even if it means uh, memorizing uh, for seven to 10 years uh, the books and, and then uh, be set for life as, as uh, they were taught. So, we worked with them and we are currently conducting a, a thorough study 
uh, to try and uh, change that reality. And we, for instance, we found out that the, um, in Spain, any young entrepreneur who starts uh, as an individual professional must pay um, monthly a lot of money to the state only to be able to operate legally. That would be around 4,000 euros per year. So this is totally um, complicating the things, especially for middle and lower class um, income people. So I believe that through our work, we are already uh, speaking to the public opinion and they know that we are not biased and we are not, let's say, uh, losing our uh, uh, credibility as, as our follower was, uh, was uh, saying earlier. Well, thank you to all of you. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up here, but um, a huge thanks to, to Sarah, Roxana, and Arpita for joining us in, your conver in our conversation today and for sharing your insights from around the world. So my thank you to the panel, and I now want to welcome for the final segment of our program today to the stage, um, I would like to welcome Matt Warner, who is the president of the Atlas Network, a nonprofit grant making organization committed to supporting local NGOs in more than 90 countries. Matt writes, speaks, and consults internationally on the topics of economics, institution building, nonprofit management, and impact philanthropy. Welcome to the stage, Matt. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. So, you're the editor of Poverty and Freedom, Case Studies on Global Economic Development. And you, you coined this term, the outsider's dilemma, to describe the challenge of helping low-income countries develop, but without getting in the way of their most viable paths to prosperity. How does this idea connect with what's being discussed today? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's highly relevant. I just wanna say how um, rich this discussion has been. I mean, I immediately think of, when, it, when you mentioned the outsider's dilemma, I think of the recommendations that Sarah Lucas made from the Hewlett Foundation and their long experience working with think tanks. You know, the outsider's di dilemma is the idea that we want to help uh, people in low income communities and we want to see them thrive. And that does tend to uh, lead us into the trap of thinking that we can solve that for them as opposed to supporting their own solutions for, for change. So, uh, in this vein, the local think tank, uh, as I think this report that has been uh, so robust uh, and, and done so well by foreign policy is showing, is that local think tanks are really an undervalued resource because as they're growing in both number and quality, they're really in a very unique position in order to, um, yes, learn from each other and from a global sharing of ideas, but to um, put those through the lens of local culture and history and really have that nuance to understand best fit solutions to get from where they are to where they need to go. So I, I just really echo when it comes to solving the outsider's dilemma. I do think there is something that outsiders can do to help, but it's really taking a, a, a more of a backseat role in learning first, what are the priorities of uh, local voices? Where do they see the problems? What's already starting to work that can be scaled up and support that? Um, and I think in a practical sense, uh, providing, as Sarah said, you know, make sure you're, you're being generous and, and understand the full cost of what, what it takes, but also um, uh, let, let them define success and share with you what's important to them. If it's persuasive, then as a funder, you, you can hold them accountable to it, but that's much, much better than um, letting our, our own particular priorities or preferences or, or opinions uh, really dis distort what ought to be happening uh, on the ground. Mm -hmm. We actually got an excellent audience question um, from John Frederick Ocheno Owiti, who is the founder of African Senatal from Nairobi, Kenya, which, which taps into this theme. Um, John asks about think tanks that are championing democracy, especially in Africa, and he asks, how can these think tanks get freedom to explore the practical ideas of democratization in Africa whilst avoiding dictates coming from donors or juggling those dictates coming from donors? Yeah, no, it's really tricky. I think I think what this report is hoping is hopefully helping us see as it, it, it has recommendations for both donors and think tanks. As donors 
learn to become a little bit more humble about knowing what the answers are for local problems. Um, at the same time, I, I think it invites think tanks to become more uh, confident and entrepreneurial in demonstrating their value proposition, uh, really honing the way that they talk about their own vision and clarifying that um, so that they, they can sell their vision to donors as opposed to um, responding to donor priorities and, and adapting to fill those needs. So it, I think it's this, it, the trend's going in the right way. Uh, I, I've encouraged by the broader talk in the development community about uh, localization in general, but I think we all have a lot to learn about how, what does that look like in practice? Um, and, uh, and to really be collaborative and listen uh, to, to each other and understand that donor knowledge and expertise from a foreign land is really you know, great to share knowledge, but to be a little bit humble about the practicality. We have 30 years post-Cold War of trying to install uh, you know, a certain model of institutions around the world. But uh, while good, good institutions have a lot in common, they're really idiosyncratic to time and place in local context. And lo local voices are going to be the ones who are going to be uh, best positioned to really strengthen and build the institutions that will be governing them. Absolutely. I mean, we heard a lot today about the importance of, of the def, you know, letting success be defined by, by local partners, people implementing programs by local think tanks. But how do you ensure that you're letting them lead on what impact is and what impact matters and what it looks like, whilst also ensuring accountability as a funder? Yeah, I think that's really important. I'll tell you uh, the way that we do it, just to give a very practical example. Uh, we do ask for a very clear set of, of outcomes defined, but we don't define those. The grantee that's proposing uh, uh, a request for funding defines those. We, we may provide feedback on, on how well those outcomes are articulated or made clear, but we don't editorialize on whether they're the right outcomes, et cetera. Now, part of what uh, Brian Joseph talked about, which is very relevant here too, is um, and Sarah mentioned it, is, uh, is not just uh, funding a think tank in a vacuum, but thinking about the, the ecosystem. So, and the importance of sharing ideas in a network is so that we're not all working alone. So part of what um, gives us the confidence to be able to be more agnostic about what the local grantee says is the priority is that we're also doing those sort of convening and networking and peer learning experiences so that we really get, get to know these grantees and have a deep understanding of uh, you know, track records so that it gives them an opportunity to demonstrate their trustworthiness uh, and inspire confidence in a, in a donor community that, that um, can more confidently be hands off and say, hey, those sound like ambitious outcomes. Uh, we, we, we know you're, you're a legitimate operation that operates in good faith and you're ambitious and, and you care about your community. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to be excited to uh, celebrate you when you achieve that success. Well, thank you so much. So thank you so much, Matt, for joining us today and for, for sharing your insights and takeaways. Um, and a big thank you again to the Atlas Network for supporting today's program and the report. And a reminder to everybody tuning in that the report is available at navigatingthroughturbulence.com. I'd like to say thank you again to all of our speakers that we've had today who've spent time with us to share their insights and perspectives. And of course, thank you to our global audience as well for tuning in. A full recording of this event will be available shortly on FP's event website, which is foreignpolicy.com forward slash events. FP events is going on a summer break for the month of August, but we'll be back in September with a busy and exciting program for the fall. Stay tuned for updates and find out more at foreignpolicy.com slash events. Thank you again. Take care. We'll see you soon. <laughs>